Hello and welcome to The Age of Light. My name is Shelley James and it's a very great pleasure to welcome Ian McRae to our conversation. Ian um, is an electrical engineer but has also worked in and around lighting for many years and so he's really seen the whole lighting sector from many, many different angles, the good, the bad and the very ugly. Um, what Ian's going to tell us a little bit more about today is his view on how to um, make sure that when you buy uh, or specify luminaires that you are buying something which is really going to work for the long term, that's going to be sustainable, that's going to be properly built. Um, and he's got some wonderful horror stories to share with us about um, the cheap and the not so cheerful. So Ian, over to you please. Hi, I, I, I ought to start by correcting you because I'm not technically an electrical engineer, lighting oh. engineer perhaps. Um, but don't please don't ring me up and ask me to do electrical design because I'm, I'm not chartered in that. But yeah. Um, chartered lighting engineer and so many years working with some top clients around the world some of the big projects and also some really small projects and some some horror stories on the way um, and what I've got for you just is is only a few sort of background images just to explain KPIs performance measures that luminaires or, or people specifying lighting might want to ask questions about and we can have some some discussion really about whether you'll get the information from the people you're talking to, but that's not a reason for not asking. Um, and perhaps we start, if I, if I just show you the first slide, which is kind of introduction, okay. Um, the thing that started this conversation, I think if you remember, was we talked about ramen noodles and I actually had a better image than this because ramen noodles should look much higher quality and much more tasty. Um, but this was a, a product that started me thinking about how we specify lighting. I can't it's clearly... see your screen. Have you got, is, are you sharing your screen with us now? I... Let's share that. So see if that makes any better. That's yeah. Better. There um, so this was a product. It's called the Ra Rapid Ramen Cooker. And it was done on Shark Tank, which is kind of the cheaper, uh, more competitive version of Dragon's Den. But it's done in America. And they bid for money. And it got me thinking about how we specify luminaires. Because if you look at this image, you'd think okay, I'm getting the perfect ramen cooker and it's going to make great ramen noodles. And then stuck in the middle of that screen there is this wonderful image. Uh, if I can get the, the, the it come up, that says healthy, reduces sodium by 50%. And I got thinking that that's pretty clever. There must be some really great physics or biology inside this thing. But when you read the back of the package, which is what you don't get when you buy stuff on Amazon and, and all these other portals, it says, to lower the sodium just half the seasoning. And that got me really thinking, uh, wh why would you promote that? Uh, why do people want to buy that? <laughs> I can understand, but why would you promote that? And actually, if you look just under that, it says also must add water, because if you use this thing in a microwave, which is designed for, it will actually melt without water in it. Okay, so how does that relate to lighting? Well, here's an example. So here are two luminaires. So the, the two left-hand images are what you can buy on, off Amazon. A reputable lighting company. I mean, these guys, Philips, they've been around for decades and they sell really great stuff. Uh, so you, have, you, you can't blame them. You blame the person, the marketing person that put this on Amazon. And it says, you might get a five-year warranty, but it doesn't really explain how. Uh, mm. If you know what you're reading, it says at the top 840, you see in that little red box, 840K. Well, the K shouldn't be there. 840 is to do with the color, color appearance and its ability to reveal true color. And down in the bottom, there's a little description which says 34S. And I suspect that means 3,400 Kelvin. We'll come to, to color appearance later. And the S probably means silver. But if you were to buy that, there's pretty useless information. I mean, you'd get a luminaire. And actually, I have bought this luminaire and I've tested it and it's not bad. Um, I bought two others at the time which had even less information and proved to be pretty terrible. Um, the image on the right, I get loads of emails, loads of um, news feed items about lighting. And this was one that came through and it's really interesting. Basically, it's a, it's a lamp, it's a bulb. Okay. I know it's frosted. That's quite interesting. I know it's an A19. If you don't work in lighting, that means nothing whatsoever. It's the shape. Um, I know it's going to have an estimated 10 year lifespan, but no one's telling me how that work is worked out. And I know it's got an E26 medium base. I mean, Okay, that kind of tells you where, where it's going to go. Um, so I think as a consumer, even as a professional buying stuff online, it, it's really, really difficult. 
So we have to point you in the right direction. Um, we don't really have police in the lighting market. We don't really have police in trading standards. We'll do some stuff, but um, what should you look for? Um, well, I think first off, look for the CE mark. Be careful which one you look for, because there is a rumor that there's one called Chinese export. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying the Chinese make bad quality. They can, they make good quality. They can, and you can buy that in other countries as well. But you want the one that refers to the legality of selling stuff in Europe. And in lighting terms, that means it will comply with a, a whole raft of British European standards. EN 6598 is the magic number to look for. Um, and I'd look for that on a test certificate somewhere on a website. I'd ask the manufacturer for it. Um, I'd be pretty much painful and I'd ring them up and say, send me a copy. Um, and in my professional business, um, I'd also go and find a copy and, and read the test report and sit down with them, and have a cup of coffee. Of course, not everyone can do that. Um, so everybody can do that, but they wouldn't understand what they were reading. I mean, we're, gonna, we're having a conversation with Andy Guest about uh, about lighting and testing. So uh, that, that yeah, and, and Andy would know much more about it. Um, and you should go and find out the professionals. You know, the test, the independent test houses are great places to go and get uh, unbiased information. I mean, I know they take fees off manufacturers to test stuff, but they're normally doing the right thing and and kind of policing the market. And they'll go back to the manufacturers and say this doesn't work or that does work or you know or whatever. But looking for that magic C mark is a start. But all that does is just say you've got a safe legal product, mm. um, and you probably need to go a little bit further than that, uh, and and say okay, so what's what's next on the list? And I would say understand light understand human beings because we can have a light source here. I've got a candle and it's giving out all sorts of energy. If you want the physics, it's giving out electromagnetic energy, but it's giving out energy, but we can't see all of that. We can feel some of it. If you put your hand near it, it gets hot. That's still energy, but it's no use to me to see. It becomes a heater perhaps. So if I take the output of that and I multiply it by what my eyes can see, this has a wonderful name, the photopic curve or the V lambda curve, but basically it's my response to different colors of light and it's your response too. you know, it's the average human. If I multiply those two together, I get a thing called luminous flux. You might see it on a box of illuminaires, lumens, so many lumens. And it's useful because you put so many watts of power in, but that's rubbish. You don't get, you, you get light out. So you need the number of lumens out. And we've spent a lot of time trying to educate the public professionals are a little bit better already what a lumen is, what it means, why you buy it, how many hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of lumens you need. So typically a house lamp might start at 300 lumens, something like that, maybe a little bit less. Um, you'd go up into, yeah, typically the downlight, you know, that circular luminaire you see in the ceiling in offices, that might be uh, anywhere between one and 4,000 lumens. Uh, if you watch football, you're going to see in stadium, um, the floodlights there are 20, uh, sorry, 220,000 lumens. Um, we won't even get into the sun because it's, it's, it's crazily, yeah, a huge amount of lumens. Um, so you specify lumens first, how many lumens to buy one? And the problem is if you're used to specifying the 40 watt house lamp, you won't know how many lumens that is. So you're gonna have to play around. If you're in the commercial world, retail, hospitals, healthcare, um, schools then there are some magic numbers you know you you can get to but um it's worth researching how bright you want it to be then you need to know how long it's going to last sorry there's loads of information on this graph no that, that's good just just a question the yeah. um the, the, the lumens is there a kind of a rough equivalent in what no not, not and that's the real problem because if you go back only 10 years you know we were in the kind of compact fluorescent era mm. And if you go back 20 years, we were certainly in the tungsten halogen era. Um, and a lumen for a tungsten halogen fitting um, wasn't great. Um, so a lumen for a tungsten halogen era, you know, you might get a, a, a lumen, sorry, a thousand lumen light fitting. You come into to compact for us and it might drop to about 600 uh, up to 800 and you're coming to LEDs and you're still wanting six to eight hundreds, but the wattage has gone down dramatically. So you might've gone from a, a 40 watt down to um, a, a 20, 24 watt compact for us. And, and now you've gone down to an eight, 12, something like that wattage LED, but you're still getting the same light output. So just, just kind of as a, as a general kind of rule of thumb, say a, the equivalent of 
sort of a, a 40 watt kind of quite a gentle sort of bulb you might have a lamp sorry lump you might have in a bedside lamp what sort of lumens is that just as a kind of a benchmark i mean typically for <laughs> that's okay. a really tricky question because it might be around 300 340 something like that okay. but if you had the bare lamp you know if i'm holding it here in front of you all that light gets out of it you know it comes through the glass and it gets out and it hits the walls and it lights everything the moment you put a shade over the top of it to make it more decorative yeah. Yeah. some of that stuff gets blocked um oh sorry that's my phone going and what we should really have done is turn it off there you go <laughs> forgive me viewers or a problem um Okay, so, so let's move on to that. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just I'm still trying to get some sort of, you said you have to go into it. It's like, well, how on earth do I begin to go into it? I guess it means I need to buy some lamps and just kind of plug them in and say, well, that's a 340. Well, million. I think one of the things you can do, you know, if, if you've got your local DIY store, uh, less so the supermarkets, but DIY stores quite often have displays. Yeah. And you can go and see what lamps are there. Or sometimes you can get them plugged in and play around with them. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm absolutely a fan of going and buying a range of stuff, bringing it home, plugging it in, seeing what it does. Yeah. And and as a light, professional lighting designer, I also, you know, I trust some manufacturers, but I still like to chuck something in the ceiling and see what it looks like and what it does, yeah. um, whether the light goes where they, they say it's gonna go, and, and indeed whether it's gonna go where I want it to go. So if you're designing a luminaire and, and you're, you're doing some fantastic iron work and and built in shade and stuff it's not until you get that light source inside that you see the patination of light as it comes out mm. and it's only when you see that that you realize you might need more or less light and that sort of stuff is very difficult to to model digitally you know you can't put it in a in a computer package and, and come up with it unless you're paying thousands to do that um so i think yeah playing around with stuff is really is worth okay. it good. good and we'll come to um some aspects of color because you'll get told one thing by the manufacturer of the lamp and sometimes it's not always the truth um, or it's their interpretation of the truth um, so yeah it's important to play around with the number of lumens and see what you get and the direction out of your lamps also because you get a spotlight or a or just a, a an opal globe and that makes a difference sure. um, if we went on to life you're going to pick that lamp up and you're not going to know how long it's going to last and this is really confusing because the old lamps, they would go pop and they, there was no light out and you had to replace it. Now you've got these things called LEDs and they gradually diminish in light out, but they follow this blue curve and they get less and less light output. But, you know, I'll probably die before they stop giving out light completely, you know, because they're electronic devices just keep on going. So we've invented this thing called the median rated useful life. You can just call it useful life if you want. And it's the point at which the light source gives out just enough light for it to be useful. And after that, you say it's failed, it's, it's, it's beyond its life. Mm -hmm. So that could be 70% as I've marked on this graph. You could choose more than that. 70% um, typically is for offices. It would work for homes as well. In something like a corridor, we might accept down to 50%. Um, so is, is this, I'm just gonna move this along because I'm aware of the time. So just, um, is that information available online? Yes, you, it so, should be from reputable manufacturers. You should see an L number. It'll probably be L70 or L80 okay. or L90. It might have a B factor in. Ignore that. That's really not important. And it'll give an hours, a number of hours. 50,000 is typical, 35,000 or, or 15,000. What you have to do is you have to work out what that means in, in your application. So well, exactly, yeah. Hotel corridor, 50,000 hours, six and a half years. Okay. Not very long. Um, house lamp. 50,000 hours, uh, yeah, that's going to be 20 plus years. You never, it's never going to really fail for you. Some do fail prematurely. Um, you know, their electronic devices, they may go pop, but most of them just diminish with that, with time. Okay, we, we diminish with age, we know that. We do. <laughs> you might want to look at warranties as well. Um, you'll get 10 year warranties, five year warranties, three 50,000 hour warranties, year warranty, actually technically in Europe, whilst we're still in Europe. Um, that should be warranted for at least two years. Okay. Um, but read behind the scenes, yeah? And uh, th that's important because it might be from the date you buy it, it might be from the date you switch it on, it might be from the date of manufacture. Mm -hmm. okay. It, it okay. might could cover all sorts of stuff. But also re re retrieving that, I mean, it involves sort of keeping the packaging and keeping, I mean, honestly, a couple of years, are you really gonna have that information to hand anyway? So, so that's another 
that yeah and uh, that's one of the problems with warranties um you kind of have to keep the receipt in some cases you actually have to go onto a website and register the product yeah. and how many of us really do that for a light bulb it's it, you know for an expensive luminaire you know if you're spending five to nine hundred euros something like that of course you're going to do it and if you're buying thousands of course you're going to do it yeah. sometimes yeah. it's just cheaper to go and buy another one unfortunately yeah okay so you need to look out for those things when you're Amazoning or eBaying to find your luminaires, you need to check the um, that it's got a C mark or some kind of um, and a warranty and a lifetime figure if you can find them. Um, I would say if you're not finding that sort of information, then it probably does exist. You may have to go to the manufacturer's website rather than Amazon. Amazon are a bit um, difficult to find information on, and, and they mm. and they would just say, look, we're a portal. Um, we're just marketing the manufacturer's information. It's how they put it on there. But th then you should go to the man manufacturer and ask them. Um, I've got three images here. Which one do you like? I can't. I can't. Oh, okay. There's um. Um, I think so, the one. The one in the middle. So, so what we've got here is is um, different color temperatures. So, so color temperature is just a magic number we put against the appearance of a space. So on the left, we've got 3000 Kelvin. This is quite warm. Your face would look beautiful. Your skin tones would look beautiful under this because it would make you look warm and rosy and healthy. In the middle, we've got typically what you get in offices in the UK, which is fairly washed out and, and neutral. It's white, you know, you'd, you'd see it as white. And on the right hand side, we have nearer daylight. So this is quite a cold color temperature. Now, if you've got a modern house, chances are you've got that in your kitchen. Um, if you've got a modern house, chances are you've got 4,000 in your bathroom and it's going to make you look washed out and unhealthy. But you can choose that to influence how a space looks. Lots of modern spaces, clean whites and, and clean cut lines, you're probably going to want for a colder colour temperature. Lots of daylight, you're going to want to match to a colder colour temperature. So look for sort of 5,000-ish. But to be honest, if you're spending morning and evening in a house, you want to be the other end. You want to be warm because it matches sunrise and sunset. So look for warm colours. Not all manufacturers get it right. So there are some terms, warm, neutral or intermediate and cold or cool. Some of them will get that mixed up. So look for the numbers. If I want it warm, I need to be less than 3000. Um, domestic environments, typically human environments. If I want busy office environments, four or even 5000 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. Great. That's an easy one to find. That's normally on the box. You might not find this one or you might find something about this one. So if I take light from my candle, and I shine and, and I measure it, it's got a whole lot of colors in it. That colored light hits the materials I want to light. That can be my luminaire itself. It can be me as a human being. It can be my, my fashion, my blue jumper. Um, in this case, I've shown some pencils. If the light's got the color in it, the pencil will glow that color and the reflected light hits our eye. Okay, so we want as much color in the light source as possible. So we measure that by a thing called color rendering. We shine it onto eight standard colors. We measure what we get back. We average the score and we give you a score out of 100. You'll find, you should find that on the side of the box. Typically color rendering 80, okay? That's good. 90 would be excellent. Do you need 90? Probably not. In a healthcare environment, in a print matching environment, perhaps as a, a perfect artist studio, you might but generally we only need about 80 because the eye is very good at adapting. Um, street lighting, typically old street lighting is down in 20 or 40. Um, emergency lighting is down at 40 because color doesn't really matter. Modern street lighting, modern office lighting will be up at 80s um, and good color. You can get some problems with LED. Um, there are another actually seven colors. I've missed 15 off here, but LED is very poor at red or cheap LED is very poor at red. So that nine, that R9 sample won't pop. Imagine going into a supermarket and picking up a red apple and it doesn't quite look right. The, the red's just not as you experienced it as a child. And that's because that R9 value is lacking. Um, and LED on this one, you'll see there actually there's R9 and R12 and you can get very low scores. That's hidden by a lot of manufacturers. Again, best thing you can do buy a sample buy a lamp get out you know go to your wardrobe get out loads of materials go to the kitchen get out some apples red and green apples and stuff like that and put those colors under those light sources and then put them under daylight and see how they vary and that will tell you whether your light source is bringing out things like the reds um, it's a particular industry problem we've got at the moment but it's getting better 
Um, that's called color rendering. Be aware of that one. Flicker. This is my bedside clock. Um, you have to be a little bit careful with Flickr. So this is a very fast, um, high definition camera, very badly focused as it happens. Um, and you see the Flickr in the video and the eye can pick that up. Um, there's some research that says the eye can pick up up to 800 flickers, but you know, on offs per second. Um, typically TVs are about 70, some modern TVs about 140 times a second. Um, don't trust your camera to pick it up because your camera is actually programmed to remove flicker, especially if you've got an iPhone. Um, but it can be measured if you want me to come along. Oh, I'm quite expensive, um, but you can pick up a meter that will do that for you. Um, so if there are other lighting designers around who can measure that for you. <laughs> what you could ask for is the only standard which exists, which is IEEE 1789. And if you get compliance to that, pretty certain you won't see any flicker. And that means that if you suffer from migraines or other sorts of um, conditions which are affected by flicker, then that you need to make sure that you use those lamps. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, I was talking to a client just a couple of weeks ago who has some some migraine effects from flicker, and also we think from from brightness overall intensity. Um, yes, it, once you take that flicker out, in her case, we took the flicker out, and then we realised it was sunlight that was causing the problem. So we then did some shading work. Um, but yes, it could be flicker and, and you will find um, not being sexist, but about 10% of the male population are more susceptible to flicker. It doesn't appear to be a, a problem in women, but I'm, I'm open to someone ringing me up now and saying, I've got this bit of research which suggests it's the same. Um, but yes, some people are more susceptible and you will find it. Uh, it's generally not when you're looking at the light source. It'll be when you're reading a book and the light source is off in your peripheral vision. It's over here somewhere. Mm -hmm and your eye will go, oh, there's something moving over there and you'll want to look at it. And it's the flicker of the light source. Okay. Um, again, it's getting much better. Um, it's not really about the LED, it's about the driver technology and, and manufacturers are improving that. Um, I have <laughs> some, some old yeah. lamps that, that still exhibit it. It looks terrible, but you know, I, I must get around to changing them. So that's something else to look out for on your specification sheet and that's going to separate um, a cheap and nasty from a, from a reasonable or even a very good lamp. Yeah, but it, it's probably one of the more difficult ones to find. Um, but it's again, really critical. it's pretty critical, I think, because it's one of those subconscious things and it's going to trigger health effects that you're not aware of. I mean, at the extreme, you're not going to get it in LED light sources, but in the extreme, you get down to sort of uh, anywhere between 3 and 30 hertz and it will bring out epileptic fits. Mm -hmm. So there are cases, you know, as a commercial lighting designer, I have to be very careful I don't create that. As a road lighting designer, we can create it in different ways, actually. Um, and that's the last thing you want to do is, is to have someone having a fit because your lighting is, is you know, you, you clearly haven't selected it correctly. Um, so, yeah, go on. Then, so these are the main things you need to look out for and I guess be a bit more demanding about when we go online to find a luminaire and not necessarily just buy on price. Yeah, yeah. And I've got a couple of others just just quickly. Look, here's, yeah. here's one. When you have a light source called an LED, you put power into it and you get light out of it. Actually, it needs a driver. That's the image in the middle. You put power in, you get less, or you put slightly more power in, you get less light out. And what you actually buy is a luminaire. And you put power in, you get light out, but some of that light is lost by the optics, the shading, etc. Mm -hmm. In Europe, um, you have to be careful which number you talk about, because they're all called efficacy. Translate that to English, efficiency. Um, and as a supplier of an LED, you're allowed to talk about your LED efficiency, as a supplier of LED with gear or a lamp, then you talk about the lamp efficacy. And as a luminaire manufacturer, you must talk about your luminaire efficacy. Um, so be careful which one you want. So if you're gonna buy a lamp, you're looking for the number in the middle, which is power into the lamp and actual light in lumens out of the lamp. Um, that should be easy to work out because you'll get a lumen output on the box and you'll get a power in on the box divide by one by the other you get the efficacy the reason that's important is if you're designing for home and there's some building regulation requirements as the efficiency of lamps you can put in your house and if you're designing for commercial there's even tougher building regulation requirements so there are some legal minimums you have to achieve currently i think that's around the 60 lumens per watt um, so just keep an eye on that number the better the higher the number the more efficient it is and the final one i think glare um, this is really difficult Okay, glare, imagine headlights, uh, driving against a car and you can't see what's behind it. That's disability glare. 
Um, you get the same from the sun, but we can do something about that. We can say, wear sunglasses or put our hand up. But luminaires are, are a big problem. They're a man-made problem. And if the light source is too bright against what you're looking at, you can't see what you want to look at. Um, and it, no, less of a problem in domestic environments because you tend to have nice soft shades and, and the light's quite close to the wall. Um, but again, in things like sports floodlighting, we can create this image where you can't see past the floodlights or you can't see the players because the, the floodlights are so bright and so much in, in your direct field of view. There are some magic numbers. There's this thing called UGR. You'll find it on some boxes, mainly commercial luminaires. Ignore it. Uh, technically, you can't apply a UGR number to a luminaire in a box. You have to apply it to a, to a scheme, a lighting design in a, in a building. So be aware of that one. And then I've just summarized all that to say, yeah, have a look at this and say, work your way down the list. There's a couple on the bottom as well. Okay, it's going to have to work on UK voltage. Um, but particularly if you're going to other countries like the US, it's going to work on a different voltage. So select it carefully. Um, so that would be my bullet list of, of um, do this. Um, and of course, if you want that, um, get in touch. I'll check it on my website. You can check it on your website. Um, viewers of the video can always come back and have a look at the end of the video and it should be up there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. So um, I suppose the bottom line is that you do get what you pay for and that you Absolutely. need to ask the questions. Um, and I guess one thing we just might mention um, before we go is if you buy one, if you buy a lamp that is um, not properly designed or built, not only can it induce um, migraines and cost more money to run and make your make your apples look miserable and your face look horrible and um kind of not like the part of it cause glare and all that sort of stuff but also it can be dangerous can't it i mean some, some yes. people, when they're sold with the drivers um if they're not really properly built um they heat up, they do all kinds of things that really they shouldn't do. And so you install them into the fabric of your building and you kind of put something into the into the ceiling and you leave it thinking it's going to be fine and, and it isn't necessarily so. Yeah, there, there's actually some very specific requirements in terms of fireproofing and uh, spread of flame through ceilings. So you need, to, you know, if you're going to put these in your home, uh, especially if there's insulation in the ceiling behind or if you're going to put it into commercial property and there may be fire blankets and stuff, um, then you need to be careful you choose the right luminaire. Um, I think the safety thing is quite important, especially if, if you're buying from a reputable company, that safety should be dealt with. Um, but the Lighting Industry Association did some surveys last year and they're redoing them at the, at the moment. And they bought some fittings off Amazon as a platform. And as, there were actually two other platforms they used as well. And the vast majority of those luminaires were dangerous to the point that they could uh, cause fatalities. Um, and that's not a good situation to be in because most of the people buying off those platforms don't know what they're buying and they shouldn't be able to buy illegal stuff essentially. So you, it is buyer beware. I would say if you ask these sort of questions and you start getting answers, then that manufacturer probably knows what they're talking about. And that's a good test for a manufacturer. If they start saying, no, it doesn't matter or I haven't got the data, then perhaps go and look at someone else. Because there are good manufacturers out there who have all the data to hand and they know what they're talking about. And those are the, the people you really want to find. And they're keen for you to understand that difference so that they can justify their price point. Because as a general rule, those reputable brands are a bit more expensive. But I think over yeah. time... Yeah, do you know um, that, that, that panel I showed you at the beginning, the Philips one? Um, everyone would say, look, it's a reputable brand because they clearly know what they're talking about. They have a very good reputation in, in all white goods, actually, not just luminaires. Um, that was one of three luminaires. The cheapest luminaire was £15.99. The Philips one came in just under £19. And the most expensive, which actually was one of the poorest performing, came in at nearly £58. So it's not the case that cheap means rubbish. Big manufacturers who know what they're doing sell volumes and therefore can be cheap. So again, do your research on the supplier. Um, that doesn't mean that just because they're cheap, that's a, that's a rubbish product. It just means they know what they're doing. You know. Great. That, that's good advice. And, and, and the other thing that you mentioned at the beginning is if in doubt, buy a couple and just offer them up, see how they look. I've certainly, for me, when I'm buying drivers, I plug them in and leave them on for a week uh, just to make sure they're not overheating, to make sure that they work. So again, I think... Um, Buyer beware, and um, if you do your homework, then there's so many exciting products out there that you can buy. Yeah, just be careful. absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's an exciting time in luminaires and light sources, and 
and putting all that stuff together in weird and wacky designs. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Ian. And Thank you, uh, yeah, your details will be on the end of this uh, video. So uh, yeah, if anyone know. wants to ask a question, just yeah, get in touch and we'll see if we can help you out. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye now. Cheers, Shelley.